Um, the objectives of this module are uh, fivefold. First, we would like to describe the impact of the environment on human health and the types of environmental risks to which humans are exposed. Second, to introduce the key steps and principles of environmental risk assessment and the pathways that connect human health to the environment. Third, we will discuss existing national and international health protection policies and programs to existing and emerging health risks. Fourth, we will reflect on the impact of environmental health risks on equity, vulnerability and resilience. And finally, we will try to critique the role of various sectors such as research, academia, public health, public policy, etc in contributing to and supporting an effective response to environmental challenges to health outcomes. So, let us begin by first trying to locate uh, public health morbidity, mortality in the overall picture of environmental issues. Thinking about health and well-being in the context of development requires a broad multidisciplinary understanding of the interaction between humans and their ecosystems. Events in the past few decades have brought to the forefront the need to understand the linkage between the environment in which we live and the potential hazards it poses to our health. On December 4th, 1984, more than 40 tons of methyl isocyanate gas leaked from a pesticide plant in Bhopal, immediately killing about 4,000 people and causing significant morbidity and premature death for millions more. The leak was caused by a large multinational conglomerate, which was able to distance itself from the disaster for the most part due to weak laws relating to environmental safety, indicating a need for strengthening the laws and its provisions. About three decades later, there was another environmental disaster in India. This was the flooding in the state of Uttarakhand in 2013, many of you might recall this, claiming more than 6,000 lives. This was attributed to climate change and poorly managed development policies premature melting of the Himalayan glaciers, as well as unseasonal monsoon rains, creating the conditions for extensive landslides and back flooding. The situation was exacerbated by multiple dams, haphazard diversion of rivers, and illegal tourist and other development along the river banks. The need to understand and manage environmental risk to morbidity and mortality and create legal and policy frameworks to safeguard against rampant flouting of environmental safety measures is now the need of the hour. There is clear evidence that environment and health are closely connected. The World Health Organization has data that suggests that environmental factors account for 24% of the world's burden of disease 35% in regions such as Sub-Saharan Africa and 23% of all deaths. The environmental changes are largely attributable to human activities and resultant driving forces and pressures, increasing global warming, exacerbating risk factors that have an impact on human health. Among the 26 environmental, behavioral and occupational risk factors, Evaluated by WHO as part of a comparative assessment of the causes of global and regional burden of disease for the year 2000. If you look at table one, it shows that climate change is causing excess disease burden in the developing world. India is also experiencing similar challenges by increased rate of water related diseases like diarrhea, vector borne infections like malaria and a dual burden of malnutrition. Climate change is projected to cause an additional 250,000 deaths per year from malaria, diarrhea, heat stress, and 
undernutrition between 2030 and 2050. Children, women, and the poor in developing countries will be the most vulnerable. The Health and Environment Linkages Initiative of the WHO recommends that policy should address the root causes of climate change, as well as take action to adapt to a changing climate through actions that immediately improve the health of the poorest communities and also reduce their vulnerability to climate change effects in the future. At the national level, there are several programs that address issues related to disease control, improved accessibility to water, sanitation, and hygiene, malnutrition, such as the National Vector-Borne Disease Control Program, WASH, ICDS, uh, Midday Meal Scheme, National Health Insurance Schemes, the Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases, etc. The draft National Health Policy 2015 also talks about a few of the areas stated above. However, progress on implementing the provisions of available policies and programs to reduce environmental risk to health has been slow. And there is a need for a great deal more focused research on the linkage between environmental health hazards and its impact on human health in order to respond in an effective manner as we go forward. What is the impact of environment on human health and what are the environmental risk factors that we need to be concerned about? This is the next section of this lecture. A World Bank study on the contribution of environmental factors to ill health concluded that one-fifth of the total burden of ill health in Andhra Pradesh could be attributed to environmental causes. This is the case in one uh, state of India, but could be generalized to other states as well. The study goes on to state that morbidity and mortality caused by major environmental risks account for about 20% of the total burden of disease in India as a whole, second only to malnutrition and ahead of all other preventable risk factors. The World Health Organization estimated, based on comparative risk assessment, evidence synthesis, and expert evaluation for regional exposure and WHO country health statistics 2004, that the annual environmental burden of diseases was 65 dalis per thousand population. Globally, this ranges from a low of 13 and a high of 289 dalis per thousand. And in India, this translates to about 2.7 million deaths annually, accounting for 24% of all deaths worldwide. The same report indicates the environmental burden of disease in India for a range of disease conditions. Here we will see that various disease groups have been um, looked at from the point of view of the number of dalis lost, both uh, in India and globally. And when we see, for example, the number of dalis lost due to diarrhea, the world's lowest country rate is 0 0.2 dalis per thousand population. The world's highest rate is 107 dalis per thousand population. India is at 15 dalis per thousand population. Similarly, the data has been presented for respiratory infections, malaria, other vector-borne diseases, lung cancer, other cancers, neuropsychiatric disorders, cardiovascular disease, and so on. What are risk factors or environmental hazards? Generally, environmental risks are categorized in the following five categories. The first are biological hazards, such as bacteria, viruses, parasites, protozoa, and fungi. The second are chemical hazards, from harmful chemicals in air, water, soil, food, and man-made products. The third are natural hazards, such as fire, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, floods, and storms. Fourth, we have cultural hazards, such as unsafe working conditions, 
unsafe highways, criminal assault and poverty. And finally, lifestyle choices such as smoking, poor food choices, alcoholism and unsafe sex. The World Bank report classifies environmental health risks into two broad categories. The first are traditional risks associated with poverty and underdevelopment, including unsafe water, poor sanitation and waste disposal, indoor air pollution and vector-borne diseases such as malaria and dengue. And the second category is newer risks due to development projects that lack adequate environmental safeguards, urban air pollution and exposure to agro-industrial chemicals and waste. These categories have been unpacked in a report issued by the Ministry of Environment and Forests, Government of India, which took stock of the environmental health situation, the risks and challenges, and put together a vision document that takes a comprehensive approach to this issue. The report acknowledges that the environment in which we live has a great impact on our health and identifies the following specific household, workplace, outdoor and indoor factors that play an important role in determining human health. The first of these is water. About 75 to 80 percent of water pollution is estimated to be caused by domestic sewage and the remaining by industrial wastewater, which could be much more toxic. Major industries that cause pollution at the point of production are distilleries, sugar, textile, electroplating, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, pulp and paper mills, tanneries, dyes and dye intermediates, petrochemicals and steel plants. There are other sources of pollution that are non-point, such as agricultural fertilizer and pesticide runoffs in rural areas. Unsafe water, ingestion of contaminants and poor sanitation are associated with infectious diarrhea, cholera, jaundice and other gastrointestinal tract infections that together are the cause of significant levels of morbidity and mortality. The environmental effects of poor water quality on human health are increasing casualties among world's poor, especially in the developing countries including India. Over 1 billion people globally lack access to safe drinking water supplies, while 2.6 billion lack adequate sanitation. Diseases related to unsafe water, sanitation and hygiene result in an estimated 1.7 million deaths every year. In India, contamination of water source such as water tap, hand pump, well, etc. could be the consequence of many factors, open defecation, improper drainage systems, monsoon flooding, land irrigation and fertilizers used in agricultural work. India accounts for 90% of the 692 million people in South Asia who practice open defecation. Water stored in containers within the household also present a risk due to a variety of unhygienic practices. Diarrheal infection due to consumption of unclean water is one of the leading causes claiming lives of many poor children. The World Bank study on environmental health in India suggests most of the health benefits from improving access to water in rural areas and to in both rural and urban areas are public benefits that accrue to the local community as a whole via the reduction in health risk for all households rather than private benefits that accrue primarily or exclusively to the households that install water connections or toilets. The second risk factor is groundwater pollution. Industrial effluents contaminate groundwater sources. Heavy metals and toxic compounds contained in these effluents pose significant health risks. Several incidents of groundwater contamination due to industrial clusters are reported, especially due to electroplating units, tanneries, dyeing and printing units, etc. Air pollution is another contributor uh, to environmental health risks such as through industries, vehicles and to a smaller extent domestic sources. Urban air pollution 
is largely as a result of combustion of fossil fuels, which cause a broad, broad range of acute and chronic conditions such as asthma. And in the case of suspended particulate matter, lung cancer. Other constituents of air pollution, such as lead and ozone, are also associated with serious health effects. Industries that contribute significantly to air pollution include thermal power plants, iron and steel plants, smelters, foundries, stone crushers, cement, refineries, lime kiln chemicals and petrochemical plants. Indoor air pollution. Cooking indoors with solid fuels such as dung, wood, agricultural residues or coal emits significant numbers of pollutants including carbon monoxide, nitrogen and sulfur oxides. The relationship of indoor air pollution with poverty is strong since it is largely the poor who cook indoors with unprocessed fuels using chulas or uh, stoves that are not energy efficient. This results in emissions of carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, suspended particulate matter and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon etc. which cause respiratory disease such as cough, dysponia and abnormal lung function. Women and children tend to be the worst affected by indoor air pollution. Use of biomass fuels such as wood uh, is responsible for the deaths of an estimated 1.6 million people annually. More than half of these deaths occur among children under five years of age. Biomass fuel is considered to be one of the leading social determinants of malnutrition among children in India. Upgrading to cleaner and more cost-effective energy te technologies such as LPG, biogas or solar power would reduce the impact of indoor air pollution significantly, especially in rural areas. As also improved design of stoves and ventilation systems and increased awareness of health risks among the public. Biological hazards, infectious disease spread by biological means constitute a significant burden of disease, particularly in developing countries. Diseases such as tuberculosis, influenza, malaria and measles are examples of diseases spread by bacteria. Viruses are smaller than bacteria but just as dangerous, causing diseases such as influenza and HIV AIDS. The latter can be transmitted even further from mother to child. Biological hazards can be transmissible spread through air, water, food and body fluids. Large-scale outbreaks are called epidemics and sometimes such epidemics can be global as in the case of avian flu or HIV AIDS. Climate change and allergens constitute a significant risk. Climate change can expose humans to extremes of weather or weather disasters. Changes in weather conditions can change the dynamics of disease vectors such as malaria and dengue. It can change the yield of agricultural crops impacting nutritional outcomes, the resurgence of pet pests and pathogens, and a range of effects on human health due to depleted natural resources and erosion of natural environments. Chemical pollutants. The Indian economy is heavily reliant on agriculture. There has been an increasing reliance on the use of pesticides to overcome and reduce the environmental risks on cultivation. Long-term exposure to pesticides can increase the risk of developmental and reproductive disorders, immune system disruption, endocrine disruption, impaired nervous system functions and development of certain cancers, children are at higher risk from exposure than are adults. Thus, it is an important environmental health issue in India and must be addressed through policy and programs. The WHO recommends a multi-pronged approach to mitigate the effects of changing agricultural practices. At the policy level, improved regulation and control of pesticide sale, distribution and use. At the health system level, systems to identify, treat and monitor cases of pesticide poisoning. And 
Three, educating the public with well-designed to inform the public as well as agriculture and healthcare workers about the risks to health of excessive or improper use of agrochemicals. Next, we have zoonotic transmission. A recent study led by the International Livestock Research Institute in the UK found a huge burden of disease that crosses over from animals to humans, zoonoses. The study found that 13 zoonoses are responsible for 2.5 billion cases of human illness and about 2.2 million deaths every year. Most of these are in middle and low income countries. While zoonoses can be transmitted to people by either wild or domesticated animals, most human infections are acquired from the world's 24 billion livestock, including pigs, poultry, cattle, goats, sheep, and camels. Next, we will look at the principles of environmental risk assessment. An environmental risk assessment is meant to ask the following questions. One, what types of health problems may be caused by environmental stressors such as chemicals and radiation? Two, what is the chance that people will experience health problems when exposed to different levels of environmental stressors? Three, is there a level below which some chemicals do not pose a human health risk? Are some people more likely to be susceptible to environmental stressors because of factors such as age, genetics, pre-existing health conditions, ethnic practices, gender, etc. What environmental stressors are people exposed to and at what levels and for how long? Are some people more likely to be exposed to environmental stressors because of factors such as where they work, where they play, what they like to eat, etc. Environmental risks are usually expressed as probabilities. A risk is the probability of suffering harm from a hazard that can cause injury, disease, death, economic loss or damage. Risk is expressed as a mathematical statement of the likelihood that an individual will be harmed by exposure to a particular hazard. So for example, the lifetime probability of developing lung cancer from smoking, one packet of cigarettes per day is one in 250. This means that one out of every 250 people who smoke one packet of cigarettes every day will likely develop lung cancer over their lifetime. Risk assessment is the process of using statistical methods to estimate how much of a risk a particular environmental hazard poses to human health and developing an appropriate strategy. A risk management strategy involves deciding whether and how a particular risk can be mitigated. So if you look at the diagram, you see that in order to conduct a risk assessment, you have to first identify the hazard, then estimate the probability of the risk. Finally, try to understand what are the consequences of that risk. This will lead to the risk management strategy, which will take into account the comparative risk analysis, try to come up with strategies that can reduce the risk, and finally, we'll try to estimate how much will this cost because all risk reduction strategies naturally come with a price tag and it depends on the resources available, what level of risk reduction strategy is possible to adopt. An exhaustive in-country review of Canadian risk management strategies adopted by a range of public agencies in the face of different types of environmental risks, food safety, prescription drug use, contaminated sites, etc., was published in 2003, which recommended the following principles for risk assessment, management, and communication. So we have on this table two columns, one which talks about the decision-making principle and next to it is the ethical concern associated with it. So the first decision-making strategy is do more good than harm, prevent or minimize risk and do good as much as possible. 
the ethical concern associated with it is beneficence or non-malfeasance. Second, fair process of decision making should be just, equitable, impartial and objective as far as possible given that the circumstances of each situation can be different. The ethical concern here is fairness and natural justice should ensure fair outcomes and equal treatment of all concerned through an equal distribution of benefits and burdens. This is the principle of equity or distributive justice. Fourth, seek optimal use of limited risk management resources and use resources where they will have maximum risk reduction benefit. The principle here is of utility. Fifth, promise no more risk management than can be delivered. Candid public accounting of what is known and what is not, what can be done and what cannot be done. The principle here is honesty. Impose no more risk than you would tolerate yourself. Understand the perspectives of those affected and this is the golden rule. Next, be cautious in the fa face of uncertainty since evidence could be uncertain. So, better be safe than sorry. Foster informed dis risk decision making among stakeholders with full and honest disclosure of all the information required for informed decisions using the principle of autonomy. Risk management processes must be flexible and open to new knowledge and this is the principle of evolving and iterative action. And finally, risk is pervasive, cannot be entirely eliminated. Life is not risk free. What we can do at best is mitigate the risk. Next, we will look at environmental health protection policies. There have been both global and national level policies that have tried to address the issue of environmental health protection. The policy framework for addressing the health impacts of environmental issues is limited. One of the early efforts to address the issue was the Stockholm Convention 2001, ratified by 50 countries which restricts or eliminates the production and use of 12 chemical substances, 8 pesticides, 2 industrial pollutants and 2 biological pollutants. The convention was appreciated widely for protect, protecting the public from DDT and for generally outlawing a whole class of chemicals due to their detrimental health effects. In fact, the convention widened the scope of such legislation considerably by stating that full scientific certainty was not a precondition for proposing the ban of a chemical. Prior to this, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992 and later the Kyoto Protocol of 1997 called for reductions in greenhouse gas emissions known to have a detrimental impact on health. Agenda 21 of the Rio Declaration is frequently cited as an important international provision that provides for the need to protect and promote human health with emphasis on meeting primary health care needs, particularly in rural areas, control of communicable diseases, the protection of the health of vulnerable groups, addressing the urban health challenge and reducing health risks from environmental hazards. More recently, the Sustainable Development Goals, which seek to revisit and build on the Rio Declaration, have adopted health as an explicit concern of sustainable development, reflected in Goal 5 and a number of specific targets. They take forward the agenda of the Millennium Development Goals, while specifically recognizing the impact of the environment on health outcomes. However, it is generally recognized that the enforcement of such treaties has been weak. In India, the National Environment Policy, NEP, formulated by the Ministry of Environment and Forests in 2006, aimed at emphasizing the environmental impacts in all, of all development activities, including conservation of resources. 
The main objective of this policy is that while conservation of environmental resources is necessary to secure livelihoods and well-being of all, the most secure basis for conservation is to ensure that people dependent on particular resources obtain better livelihoods from the fact of conservation rather than from degradation of that resource. The NEP viewed human health as an entire entity with incomparable value in the face of activities that may adversely impact the environment and cause significant risk to human health. The NEP argued that environmental degradation often leads to poverty and poor health outcomes, including malnutrition, lack of access to clean energy and safe drinking water. It recognized that rapid industrialization based on poorly assessed environmental impacts results in further impoverishment of the rural poor since they are largely dependent on natural resources for their livelihood and that groundwater contamination could cause serious hardship in rural areas since it is the sole source of drinking water in many places. Industry in urban areas, the NEP identified lack of waste treatment and sanitation, industry and transport related pollution, adversely impacting air, water and soil quality as threats to human health. These environmental risks were seen to negatively impact the capability of the urban poor, particularly to seek and retain employment, attend school and enhanced gender inequalities. The NEP emphasized the importance of reducing indoor air pollution, protecting sources of safe drinking water, protecting soil from contamination, improved sanitation measures and better public health governance in order to reduce the incidence of the number of critical health problems. The National Health Policy 2002 further reiterates the impacts of environmental change on health. It also emphasized the importance of environmental policies in India to address the impacts of environmental change on human health. For example, unsafe drinking water, poor sanitation and air pollution significantly contribute to the burden of disease, particularly in urban settings. The draft National Health Policy 2015 also addresses the impact of environmental change on health. For example, it emphasizes measures to reduce air pollution, better management of solid waste and improved water quality, particularly in urban areas. In addition, the Government of India has launched a program to address issues of water and sanitation, Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, with an emphasis on behavior change, supplemented by building modern technological approaches to public services and regulatory measures that address each of these urban health determinants. Most recently, the National Policy on Safety, Health and Environment at the Workplace was declared in 2009. The policy sets out a set of goals with the view to building and maintaining a national preventative safety and health culture and improving the safety, health and environment of the workplace. It identifies eight specific working areas including enforcement, national standards, compliance, awareness, research and development, occupational safety and health, skills development and data collection. After an initial review to ascertain the status on safety, health and environment at the workplace, the policy is envisaged to be reviewed at least every five years. Next, we will look at the impact of environmental health risks on equity, vulnerability and resilience. Environmental health has become one of the major public health issues which have to be dealt with by building resilience in an equitable manner, taking into consideration inequalities and vulnerability. Equity is the absence of avoidable or remediable differences amongst groups of people, whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically or geographically. Vulnerability is the degree to which a population, individual or organization is unable to anticipate, cope with, resist 
and recover from the impacts of disasters. Resilience is generally the flip side of vulnerability. It is the ability to survive, recover from and thrive. The impact of environmental risks falls largely on the poor and marginalized. According to World Bank estimates, the extreme poverty rate gradually dropped from 52% in 1981 to 21% in 2010, with an estimated 1.2 billion people living on less than a dollar and 25 cents a day. The average income of the extreme poor in the developing world was 87 cents per capita per day, up from 74 cents in 1981. Women represent some 70% of the 1.3 billion people in the world currently living in extreme poverty and are disproportionately affected by climate change. Environmental risks, particularly those associated with climate change, impoverish the poor or push individuals into poverty, either directly through rising food prices and agricultural production channels, or indi indirectly through livelihood vulnerabilities. The understanding of vulnerability and risks is based on the natural hazards literature and geography and the theoretical contributions of White, Burton and others on hazard characterization, risk thresholds, human behavior and adjustment to environmental risks. Climate change therefore affects health directly, undermines the social determinants of health and threatens the viability of a number of environmental services provided by natural systems. The IPCC report on managing the risks of extreme events and disasters to advance climate change adaptation defines vulnerability as the propensity for individuals and households to be adversely affected by climatic and other environmental shocks and stresses. This vulnerability is defined both in terms of exposure and social determinants. Both these aspects are seen to increase sus susceptibility to harm and reduce capacity to respond to climatic shocks and stresses. Marginalized groups are at a higher risk to be harmed by social vulnerability due to a combination of different dimensions of poverty such as uncertain income, limited assets and resources, poor knowledge and adaptive capacity, no alternative livelihood options and social exclusion. In operational terms, pursuing equ equity in health means eliminating health disparities that are systematically associated with underlying social disadvantage or marginalization, both of which are impacted by environmental factors. Eliminating systematic health disparities between social groups requires connecting their fundamental causes and mitigating their negative impact on health. Both equity and human rights principles dictate striving for equal opportunity for health by providing care to improve the health of the poor, but also by helping to alter the conditions that create, exacerbate and perpetuate pro poverty and marginalization. This argues for proactive policy and program interventions to address issues of water quality, sanitation, vector-borne disease, indoor and ambient air pollution, all of which disproportionately impact both rural and urban poor. Physical health and psychological dimensions of poverty may also play a role in influencing both climate change vulnerability and resilience of poor populations. While the terminology of resilience has a variety of meanings in the climate change literature, Within the context of poverty, resilience may be understood as the ability of poor individuals and poor communities to recover or bounce back from climatic shocks and stresses. The poor often experience higher levels of illness, mental stress, stigmatization, shame, humiliation and other burdens that compound monetary disadvantage and hinder their ability to escape poverty, respond to external shocks or plan for the future. Poverty alleviation is one of the most important strategies to reduce the impacts of climate change on the poor and of reducing inequities, inequities in the social and mental determinants of health. 
strengthening of public health systems to extend services for hard to reach populations is therefore critical to protecting the health, particularly of the poor and shielding them from the impacts of climate change. These broad based responses enhance an individual and community's own capacity to respond to a changing climate and improve their ability to respond to social and environmental shocks. On the other hand, the resilience or adaptive capacity of a society is not easy to measure. Early literature on the subject frequently assumed that wealthy industrialized societies would be able to adapt while poor, less industrialized countries could not. The IPCC third assessment report identified five features that contribute to the adaptive capacity of communities. One, economic status. Two, available technologies, information and skills. Three, status of infrastructure. Four, institutional frameworks and governance. And five, equity. Therefore, building resilience to climate risks and adapting to environmental risks needs to be part of the wider effort to improve and sustain the social and environmental determinants of health. In India, at the national level, environmental health and climate change policies are subsumed in its economic, industrial and human development policies, which come first. Environmental health and climate change policy has been reactive rather than proactive and focused largely on the energy sector. The role of various actors in responding to environmental health challenges. Laurie Garrett, in her best-selling book, The Coming Plague, has extensively researched a series of global health disasters that have been the result of a world out of balance, as she calls it. The spread of old and emergence of new diseases due to changing environmental and social conditions reveals a frightening scenario of global epidemics that have the potential of causing serious loss of life. She recommends that human beings learn to live together by addressing the environmental hazards we face by investing in better research, technologies and systems that help us to address the evolving disease challenges that are a result of globalization. For the last three decades, the WHO has scaled up its program focusing on working with national ministries of health and other partners to support and guide implementation of protective measures. The main strategy for building resilience to climate change and adapting to climate change is through improving and sustaining the social and environmental determinants of health. They recommend the following actions. Health departments should work along with other departments to address the issue of climate change and adopt the health in all approach. Regular impact assessment of sectors which are critical to vulnerable populations, such as employment, health, energy, small-scale farming, migration, gender, and children. Promoting inter-ministerial policy dialogue. Ensuring policies are socially inclusive and ensuring that new infrastructure and budgeting prioritization does not increase social inequity. Taking into account the specific needs of vulnerable populations through meaningful community engagement. And finally, use of environment friendly technologies, regulations on environment determinants of health, for example, air, water, food quality, housing safety and waste management. And Emergency preparedness and disaster risk management financing should also be taken into consideration. Most of the WHO European region's members are engaged in strengthening their health systems, in particular on infectious disease surveillance, environmental health services, early warning and disaster response for extreme events, international health regulations and planning for climate change in public health policies. This process is increasing health resilience is part of a wider approach which also includes actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions including within the healthcare sector. Africa has also established a regional inter-ministerial health and environmental process. The WHO region for the Americas which are more prone to natural disasters and risk of climate change have set a best example of adopting hospitals safe from disaster 
which are disaster resilient. Environment protection measures would be difficult to accomplish without extensive awareness raising and education on good practices. The World Climate Summit being held every year since 2010 brings together world leaders to address climate change and its impact on the environment. India has been pledging continued commitment, political as well as financial, to addressing climate change. Clean technologies are widely acknowledged as a means to deal with climate change. The Indian government's adaptation to climate change will amount to 360 billion US dollars by the year 2030, including investments in clean technologies. Despite this huge expense, experts have noticed a significant deficit in the amount that would need to be spent to address climate change, a deficit that would impact public health in addition to agriculture and water resources.